Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Adele Kaiser. I wanted to let you all know that you are in, uh, you are, I'm sorry, muted. If you have any questions, please use the chat function and I will uh, do my best to relay your question to Dan. Dan, we're ready to begin. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Turner with Turner Hydraulics. We're out of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, I am a IFPS certified accredited instructor, uh, as well as I hold several other uh, IFPS certifications. I've been in fluid power since 1982, and uh, you know I've had a very expensive education, basically paying for my mistakes. So I'll hopefully share uh, some of that education with you today. Uh, and maybe keep you from having the same expense. Uh, Turner Hydraulics, the company that I'm with, is a multifaceted business uh, with expertise in fluid power uh, component and system uh, rebuild, design, and installation. We do uh, some automation, fabrication, and we also have a division of automotive uh, equipment and uh, with sales service and nearly 40 employees for the company. So. Today, I hope to impart some of my 38 years of experience and hope that I can help somebody out there to build a better mousetrap for their customer uh, by using some of these ideas. So here we go. When we talk about synchronizing cylinders, which is the topic for the day, if that's not the case that you wanted to see, then you might want to go do something else at this point. We are talking about the ability to have two or more hydraulic cylinders operate at the same time and rate and then maintain their positions regardless of the external forces that are acting against them. So why can it be challenging to synchronize, or today we will discuss why it is challenging to synchronize cylinders, talk about the different factors that influence the best method for synchronization as far as the price, the tolerance required, critical nature of the operation to be accomplished, uh, the technology that's available and environmental conditions. We will talk about the common methods for synchronization, mechanical, mechanical hybrids, simple flow path manipulation, providing multiple fluid sources, and electronic flow path manipulation. Also talk about some unanticipated outcomes of different synchronization methods. Those are the expensive things. So why is synchronizing cylinders sometimes difficult? A lot of people just think you just hook a uh, two hoses up and put a T in between two cylinders and, and up they'll go. Well, the answer or the, the, the reason it's, it's not easy is because fluid is lazy. It takes the path of least resistance every time. So since fluid is lazy, we need to encourage it to do what we want. The uh, graphic here shows that the pump is gonna put oil into the header and the cylinder that's gonna be the less resistant is gonna be the one that's gonna move. The oil is not like somebody at Planet Fitness. It doesn't just run over there and wanna lift the 200 pound weight. It's going to take the easier path and lift the 100 pound weight if those cylinders are identical. Even if you put the T in the middle of those cylinders, generally it's not gonna make a difference. So just jump to a common example. On automotive vehicle lifts, uh, you obviously have to synchronize the cylinders, and there's a cylinder in both of those columns on the left and both of those posts on the right. So you got to wonder, uh, where's the encouragement of that oil to be lifting the heavier side of that vehicle because they're not completely balanced? Just something to think about as we start into this. So there are different methods to uh, synchronize the cylinders, and factors that determine which methods you're going to want to use are the project budget the tolerance required, critical nature of the operation, the available technology, the load distribution, and the need to synchronize in both directions. So the mechanical methods for being able to synchronize cylinders uh, are often in, in the form of guides, yokes, and cables and pulleys. Here's a very good example of the most common way to 
synchronized cylinders. What we have here is we have a cylinder on this side, cylinder on this side, and what's keeping them together is the structural integrity of this front end loader. So it's got a very heavy cross member. It's anchored very well at the corners down here, and then it again is connected at the top. So even if I take and get the corner of this underneath some uh, a concrete foundation and try to lift, the integrity of this front end loader structure is gonna keep these cylinders basically together within a couple inches, uh, and it's not gonna go out of sync enough to cause any damage. So this structure is heavy enough built, and that's a very simple, you might say, well, let's just do that all the time, but that's not the case, we can't. So this is uh, an example of basically a once and done uh, engineering uh, system. So you build that, you put the cylinders in, the system around it's designed properly, it never needs to be tweaked. Uh, maintenance on that's just some grease fittings. So on the vehicle lifts that we showed earlier, the one on the left, the synchronization method is cables and pulleys. So what we end up having is on this side, there's gonna be a pulley down at the bottom, a pulley at the top, but on the other side, the same thing goes on. And then you've got this carriage in the middle that has a cable that goes down around this pulley up across the top and then goes to the top of this carriage and then vice versa, you have the same thing going in the other direction. So the synchronization here is these cables. So they need to be tensioned properly so that you'll maintain that synchronization on the lift. Anytime a cable breaks, uh, you're basically in trouble. There are safety latches to keep that from happening. Now on your in-ground lifts like this, the methods, generally there's two different ones. One can be that there's a rack that runs both sides of this and it actually goes down to the ground. And then down here's a pinion. And then you have an axle, a nice heavy duty axle that connects those two pinions. So you see these cylinders run up and down together being guided by a rack and pinion system. There's also on these, there can be a yoke where it's actually bolted to the bottom of the superstructure in a U shape and it just goes down into a uh, containment system uh, down in the ground. So they're not magic, there's actually mechanical means to synchronize those. There's also another method is mechanical hydraulic. Uh, we often see these on brake presses where you can use a band or a cable, uh, which can be tightened or slackened as the cylinders move uh, and get out of phase with each other a little bit. And that motion of that band or cable influences limit switches uh, or a spool on a hydraulic valve. The limit switches energize or de-energize hydraulic valves if you're using limit switches. Uh, so this would actually be a mechanical electrical hydraulic solution. Both methods generally allow fluid to exit from the circuit of the leading cylinder, which would be a bleed off circuit. Here's a, a photo of a press break we have. Uh, there, it's very common to find this banding system there. Right up here, you can see that's a hydraulic valve being, it has a spring for protection just so it doesn't break the band uh, and allows a little bit of out of phasing so that you can do some maintenance on it. But the band comes down, goes across, goes to the other end, and there's like a micrometer adjustment over on this side so that you can actually make the press uh, go out a level if you want, and it's perfectly happy to do so. But you can see with the band in this configuration, as one side of the press goes down, the band either gets tighter or looser. And at that point, it's pulling on this spool up here, which is actually spring balanced. And if it pulls on or lets loose of this spool, oil is either bled off of uh, the circuit or added to the circuit that goes from the lead cylinder, which is right here, to the following cylinder, which is here. Now, the other thing of interest of this photo is that it's not optical illusion. This cylinder is actually larger. This one is larger and this one is smaller. So this is also an example of a rephasing synchronization with a mechanical hydraulic uh, synchronizer in the circuit. So that's pretty common on press brakes of all sorts. Uh, so 
whenever we're talking about using uh, flow path manipulation, <clears throat> excuse me, for hydraulic synchronization, we have to actually do something to manipulate that flow. This is very similar to the first graphic that we showed where the 100 pound load went up uh, on equal cylinders. What you're going to have to do is put a restriction in to the flow path somehow that's going to stop the oil from wanting to just run into that 100 pound uh, weighted cylinder and it actually encourages the oil to go into this 200 pound. So if it's like, well, that's all we need to do then is throw a needle valve in there, uh, we can make this work. But that's not always the simple way to do it. And as a matter of fact, we'll explain that a little bit later why that isn't the best method. Uh, common flow path components are metering valves, flow controls, and flow dividers. And often for synchronization, you're going to get a 50 50 flow divider. Uh, you can get them in different ratios, so just be careful of that. A metering valve is not the valve of choice for synchronizing. It is basically an adjustable orifice, and the flow through an orifice is dependent on the pressure drop across the orifice. The pressure drop in a hydraulic system is related or is relative to the load. So here we see two metering valves and Flow goes from the high pressure side to the low pressure side, and it is based on the pressure drop across this orifice. Changing loads causes different results. So that's exactly why metering valves don't work uh, for synchronizing cylinders just by themselves. Oil viscosity, changing loads uh, are two things that can cause cylinders that you've got synchronized uh, at the beginning to go out of sync uh, in reality. So if you have a thousand PSI on the left on both of these coming in, your pressure drop is 600 going across this orifice and you're able to achieve 10 gallon per minute. If you start to lift a load with the other cylinder first and it creates 800 PSI of resistance, you only have 200 PSI going across this metering valve and you can see the difference there is going to be uh, almost half. And uh, you've dropped your flow tremendously, and your load's going to go up uneven. So, if, and a flow control is not a synchronizing component either. It's basically a metering valve that only lets controls flow in one direction. So, this is, you can see it's a, a metering valve at the top. Flow control just allows uh, reverse flow. That is not meant to be able to uh, synchronize circuits. So how can we use flow controls to uh, help synchronize? We use pressure compensated flow controls. So now we're getting somewhere. Pressure compensated metering valve or flow control is not just an orifice. It adjusts dynamically as it reacts to the pressure drop. An orifice begins to close off when the pressure drop increases and it begins to open as the pressure drop decreases. And that makes sense because as the pressure drop increases, you're going to want the flow is going to want to go faster across that same orifice. So we need to be able to meter that flow down some. So here's what a very simplistic uh, and and yeah, these are my graphics, so uh, it's very simplistic. I'm not the graphic artist, but you've got your pressure compensated flow control has a spool that you would have just right now. It's basically the way you've got it set up for the proper flow that you want to go in. As the pressure drop starts to decrease on the right hand side here, what happens is that the pressure incoming begins to meter the spool the, or the flow through the spool and that slows the flow down across a pressure compensated flow control. So if you're going to use flow controls or metering valves to uh, be able to synchronize loads, at least make sure you've got pressure compensated uh, flow controls or metering valves. Another thing that we can do in a flow path is uh, flow dividers. These are very common. Uh, they are uh, one inlet and multiple outlets. 
Uh, they are generally used for two, three, or four cylinders when you're trying to synchronize those. Here's a photograph of a very simple spool type flow divider. You can see the inlet on the top here, and down at the bottom, there would be two outlets. And you can get those in different ratios, but for our thing today, it would be a 50 50 uh, spool that you would want to have. So if it were you know, just as simple as I said, that's what all you would ever need. But there are some issues with these, and uh, uh, and there are also uh, some inaccuracies uh, always built into the mechanical flow dividers. So it's not 100% 50-50. It could be 47-53, uh, and especially if you've got a real heavy load on one side, uh, it's going to take it to the uh, maximum inaccuracies. And whenever you go to buy these things, you can actually find the uh, uh, the plus or minus uh, tolerances that, that the manufacturer is going to say that they have under different conditions. Another thing is a, a rotary flow divider. And here we've got a, a photo of a gear type. Uh, now you see three outlets here. So on the other side, there'll be one inlet. And that is then common to all three chambers. and you know, it's really clever. There's a shaft then that goes through the gear sets and connects these guys all together. So you can't get flow out this one, out this outlet here, without these being loaded up, these gears in here wanting to turn as well and send the same amount of fluid out of these guys. So these are nice in that you can generally get these, you know, commonly in two, three, and four outlets. Uh, so, so they're pretty convenient, and if that's all you need, they work great. Uh, here's a, another rotary flow divider, a Giroller type, and uh, you know you can just see that it's basically two common uh, uh, motor groups in here, and you've got the two outlets, and on the other side you'd have a common inlet. So I just put in a uh, an animated schematic that IFPS uh, has. And uh, we'll just go ahead and play this puppy if we can. Now that I've got my, uh, let me see if I can end my cursor. Not sure how I'm going to do this exactly. I may not be able to do that. Okay, now I can. Sorry about that. So there's the animation that's going. So. We do have a flow divider right here, rotary type. We're going to shift our valve. We've got a five and five. So it's a 50 50, five gallons going each direction. We're only using a flow divider on the blind end of the cylinders. And at that point, you can see that didn't work. Sorry about that. I will try to stop it. But you can see that the one cylinder is getting ahead of the other because it's not 100% accurate. So because that can happen, you've got to be aware that there's a possibility of cylinder pressure intensification here. So you will want to consider that you should have a relief valve on both sides of the flow divider. And those relief valves should go to tank so that there's no back pressure uh, possible here that could cause it not to open up. You can use these in reverse as well. And uh, and so what happens with the intensification is that one of the if one of these cylinders deadheads first, the other one's going to be lagging, but the fluid is still going to want to go through the flow dividers through both sections. And if cylinder one is totally topped out, and cylinder two isn't pushing pushing much of a load, the all the pressure that's going to go into the flow divider is not going to be able to push into uh, cylinder one, but what it's going to do is intensify the pressure because it's going to want to keep pushing fluid into that section there. So that's where the relief valve comes uh, into place so that you're not blowing cylinders up. On this type of thing, if you had 3,000 PSI cylinders, 3,000 PSI pump, one of them tops out first and it's a two to one ratio cylinder, you could end up with 6,000 PSI uh, trying to be pushed into that cylinder, which is going to be catastrophic for the some some one of those components along the circuit. 
So on flow divider tips, uh, when using them, be aware there's a minimum flow rate. So you're gonna, when you're purchasing those or, or specking them out, make sure that you're gonna be operating right in the optimal range for that type of flow divider. Whether it's a spool type or a rotary, uh, you, you wanna be able to match the, uh, the component to the application. Uh, and all of these can be inaccurate when you're feathering like a directional control valve. So if you're gonna be operating at 10 GPM, but you're gonna feather from two GPM to 10, it's possible in that lower range, you're not gonna have the synchronization. You cannot have two metering valves set up for five GPM each and then only supply eight GPM during part of the cycle. So think about it, you've gotta have plenty of flow for both of these to be able to do their job. And that, that comes into play, especially if you're just using pressure compensated flow controls uh, separate in each line. You've got to always uh, provide plenty of flow so that the metering valves are saturated. So we're just showing here that if you've got a uh, pump at 8 GPM, but you've got both of the metering valves at 5, uh, you're not going to do very well to synchronize those. You're going to need to get, get that pump up to you know, a minimum of 10.1 GPM uh, to be able to function properly. So with uh, some tips on flow dividers, uh, the gear type flow dividers can cause pressure intensification. We talked about that. Uh, flow dividers can also be flow combiners. So on that schematic, you also saw that the cylinders were retracting in a synchronized method because the dividers were operating as combiners. Some cannot tolerate the reverse the reverse flow, so make sure you you know which ones you're working with before you try to flow back through it. Uh, single path uh, flow dividers can be commonly used with hydraulic motors uh, or with a bypass check around uh, those flow dividers. All flow dividers have a margin of error. That's the inaccuracies that we were talking about. Make sure that the machine frame can tolerate this margin of error. If not, the hydraulics may lock up or cause catastrophic frame failure. So that's that's one of the things uh, at the end as far as things not to do. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're not constraining by more than one method uh, because one way or the other, uh, the hydraulics are gonna wanna win out. And uh, we have seen machines that are constrained mechanically and then hydraulic flow dividers are used and whenever they get out of uh, sync but they're still within that margin of error they actually lock the machine up so let's talk about synchronization methods with multiple flow sources so far we've just been talking about like one flow source coming out of a pump so we can use multiple flow sources to be able to feed and, and synchronize cylinders we can use uh, multi-section pumps, which means that you might have two uh, pump sections that are exact same displacement, and the words exact same are in parentheses because they're not gonna be exactly the same. Uh, there's gonna be some tolerances there, and again, there's gonna be some margin of error. Uh, you can use rephasing cylinders, uh, similar to, you, you saw a set of them there on that press break. Uh, Cylinders are designed in matching sets of different bore sizes as far as for rephasing cylinders. One control valve uh, is what operates the lead cylinder for extension, and then you would power the, uh, uh, the return port would go to the far cylinder uh, to return them. Some type of intensification prevention and equalization is needed uh, even with rephasing cylinders. Another group of, uh, or another product we can use uh, that provides multiple flow sources are dosing cylinders, where you have several pistons tied together by a common rod inside a long cylinder chamber or, or a, a cylinder of multiple chambers. One control valve uh, operates several fluids or several chambers of fluid because all the pistons are tied together by a common rod. Uh, you do need uh, equalization valving, uh, and generally speaking, you need to what we call tighten the chain. 
which is putting some pressure in to uh, get everything uh, ready to go, get get all the seals loaded uh, and, and everything uh, at the same pressure levels. And you'll want to use, or you can use, PO checks or counterbalance valves uh, to hold the load uh, once you're using a dosing cylinder. That's not uncommon. So let's go back and talk about rephasing cylinders. Uh, this is a very simplistic sketch, but what you see here is the cylinder on the left is going to be the main cylinder. And as fluid goes into the uh, bottom of the first cylinder, the piston moves up, rod starts to lift, and as it does that, it will take the oil and channels it through the cap end down into the blind end of the second cylinder. As it moves up, it channels the oil out of the annular end and into the bottom of the third cylinder. So what you end up with here is they travel at equal rates, no matter what the loads are. So leakage across the pistons or rod seals can cause an out of phase condition which can result in pressure intensification. So you've got to be cautious of that. You would want to put valves in the flow paths between the cylinders to allow for synchronization. Because if you think about it, if, if the, the cylinder in the middle gets out of phase here a little bit, how are you going to correct that? You've got to have some way to introduce fluid uh, into that cylinder to be able to adjust it uh, either higher or lower. And you can, uh, have these made where the pistons have poppets, uh, which allow for an internal synchronization. So there would be a poppet right through the piston. So as it goes up, it allows fluid to continue into the next cylinder until it's completely up. Uh, and then the poppet would, in this piston, would open and allowing C or the, the third cylinder to go completely up and uh, everybody's topped out at that point, everybody's happy, and then you would run them back down and, and you would expect them to still be in phase uh, for at least you know, a cycle or two. Uh, so this, this can be tricky. You can buy rephasing cylinders engineered just like this for you know, multiple lifting points, uh, or you can design them yourself. The tricky math is that the annular side of cylinder one needs to fit the bore side of cylinder two and uh, you need to be able to get the right lengths of the uh, bores so that you've got just the right amount of oil uh, going from cylinder to cylinder so that's a that's not an uncommon way to do it and again as you saw the press break we only had two of those cylinders uh, and essentially uh, what we had there was then we had like we had you know the cylinder on the left and the center cylinder would be the two cylinders we had then here in the center is where we had the valve that was able to bleed off say to tank uh, so that it could equalize this the valve also was able to when it was pulled the other direction able to introduce fluid into this side to be able to get uh, the second cylinder to catch up a bit so that's rephasing. Uh, we also have dosing cylinders. And the reason uh, they're dosing cylinders, you might not have heard this. Uh, I've been calling them dosing cylinders for 20 years. And uh, uh, I know some others refer to them as the, the same. But these do not have an infinite amount of flow that they are uh, pushing to synchronize cylinders they will only provide a certain dose of oil. So you've got to be able to size your dosing cylinder specifically to the cylinders that you're lifting. And uh, you could use a larger dosing, dosing cylinder than what you need, but you can lose resolution for that as well. So it's, it's nice to have dosing cylinders that are custom matched uh, to the cylinders that you're using to lift. Again, this is a very simplistic sketch. Uh, leakage across the piston or rod seals can cause an out of phase condition, uh, which can result again in pressure intensification. So you must put valves in the flow paths between the cylinders to allow for synchronization. 
sometimes we have relief valves, we have makeup valves uh, and uh, bleed off valves. And uh, generally we'll, we'll leave valves open uh, in between operations just so there's no, uh, no pressure to build anywhere, especially if we're shipping a unit like that. Uh, pistons can be made with poppets to allow for internal synchronization. And valving can be uh, in the system to allow for preloading. And what we like to do whenever we have these is that uh, we don't just let the piston come completely back to the end here and uh, start from there to make our lift. We will generally move that piston out maybe a quarter inch. And, uh, and so we've got oil, plenty of oil in both sections. We'll actually introduce uh, some some fluid just to a certain pressure uh, into the lifting cylinders. And at that point, we have uh, what we call tightened the chain. We've preloaded the system. So as soon as this piston, these pistons here move, uh, you're going to get motion, I, basically identical motion out of your lifting cylinders, uh, totally independent of whatever the load is. You can drive these uh, double acting, so you can use the dosing cylinder as well to synchronize on the way down. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a pretty bulletproof way to do it. And depending on the design uh, and that, you know, it's, it's got fairly high accuracies. Uh, let's see, you gotta watch, if it's not double acting, we always take and make a third chamber and uh, the third chamber then we're bringing up and putting oil in it from our directional control valve and driving the pistons across. If you didn't use the third chamber, again, learn from uh, experience, you can draw air uh, through the rod seal here and uh, you always get the cylinder that's based in that chamber uh, out of phase. So if you are using single acting and be aware, you can't really suck cylinders down, but there are cases where we have single acting cylinders and we don't have enough load on them to push them down uh, fast enough. So we, we can encourage them uh, by making a third chamber and driving this cylinder by our directional control valve. Uh, these, these are interesting because uh, we just ran into a situation where we use a, an encoder on the rod, so, and we'll get into proportional control in a little bit here, but we actually were proportionally controlling several dosing cylinders, and each of those controlled their own uh, lifting cylinder. So we had a hybrid. And, and one of the things that I really want to uh, have people think about is, is you don't have to just use one technique to synchronize cylinders. You can use several techniques joined together for the best solution for that application. So if you've ever wondered, how do they lift the house? Uh, generally speaking, you know, these, these guys in around our area, uh, we have some, some home movers and barn movers uh, that are pretty low tech guys. And what they're doing is using a battery of uh, dosing cylinders, you might say, and I don't know what the, uh, I don't know if there's an actual term for this type of system, but you'll often see them arranged in a, a circular pattern. And then you have one large controlling cylinder right here, and it's got a much larger surface area in here. So it's able to impart enough force onto all of the pistons or the rods here on, on these dosing cylinders so that they're going to equally be pressed in, equal amount of fluid is going to each of the cylinders, and for house lifting, uh, this is plenty accurate. Oftentimes, you might see a, uh, a T over here and a valve that allows you to, uh, you know, put makeup oil in uh, or take oil out. So you can keep these in phase, and, and these are you know, highly manual operations. Uh, and at the beginning, whenever I said, you know, what influences which way you're gonna go, hey, you could use LVDTs, you know, cylinder positioning feedback on this, you know, and in, in get this to the nth degree, but for most house movers, uh, they're happy just to keep it simple. So 
uh, you know, and and the other thing I caution is not not just on this slide, but on any of the dosing cylinders, uh, you want to make sure you have valving that can remove the air, any any air that could be trapped in there. If you're using quick disconnects to uh, hook things together, make sure you've got a way to uh, bleed that air out so that whenever you do go to lift, you have a, a good solid lift. Okay, so we've gone through all basically the, the mechanical or easy to understand uh, ways to uh, synchronize cylinders that, that we've used uh, that I can think of. Uh, let's get into the electrohydraulic synchronization methods. Uh, and, and whenever you talk about that, you're generally going to go with proportional valves uh, to each cylinder, you know, proportional or servo valves. Uh, a proportional valve between, uh, you, you can also, you can control each cylinder with a proportional valve, or you can do the system so that you're actually putting a proportional valve, just one small valve in between two cylinders if you're using a flow divider. And again, there you've got a, a hybrid system with a flow divider slash proportional valve, and we'll show that in a little bit here. And you can also use uh, electric motor uh, VFDs uh, and multiple pumps to uh, be able to synchronize cylinders. So let's get into uh, my very crude drawing of, of what a proportional valve is. And uh, the proportional valve work is, is basically just metering valves, uh, although they are electrically adjustable metering valves. So on the left-hand cylinder, what I'm showing here is you would take uh, both of the uh, metering valves right here, and that would be combined into one proportional valve, and the same for the two metering valves on the left. So what would happen as uh, uh, your proportional valve is shifted, uh, both of these valves uh, work together, and uh, uh, you're able to close off the flow. So as you're doing that, you're creating that back pressure that we talked about and making the oil go into the other side. One of the things to realize about proportional valves is that they are not pressure compensated. By themselves, they are just needle valves. So if you just say, hey, I'm going to throw proportional valves into this system, and that will synchronize these cylinders, because I saw a guy put that on his slide once, uh, that's not the case. So what I'm saying is there has to be another part to the puzzle, not just throwing in proportional valves. The other part to that puzzle is closing the loop. You're going to have to have some type of cylinder positioning feedback. And here we're showing some LVDTs. We have to have one on each cylinder. And then they're providing their feedback to the brains of the system. The brains of the system are really potentially only controlling one of these valves. Let's say that the operator has a knob and he can control the main cylinder or the main machine feed, uh, speed. He's controlling one proportional valve uh, with a setting, but what's happening is this brain is telling this cylinder, this proportional valve, to make sure this cylinder maintains the same position uh, because these LVDTs have to read the same. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, the positional feedback is you know, often referred to uh, as part of the PID loop. And that's how the proportional valve is, is uh, controlled. One prop valve sets the pace and the electronics closes the loop and controls the other prop valve. And that is completely regardless. Uh, you could have zero weight on one cylinder and, and you know, 3,000 PSI a load on the other. So cylinder position sensing uh, is required anytime that you're using the proportional valves. You've got to know, uh, you've got to have some, some way for those valves to know to open or close. Now, I, I also put on the left-hand side here that the speed of the machine does not need to be electrically controlled. You could actually have a manual valve controlling the machine speed, but have a proportional valve on the following cylinder. And as long as you have 
LVDTs or some type of cylinder positioning in place, uh, and I'm showing LVDTs, that could be a string pot, uh, you know, some some other type of encoder. Uh, and encoder pricing, you know, it's it's all over the board from coarse to very fine. Uh, but you know, depending on the application, you know, which which method do you want to use? So anyway, you've got potentially even a manually controlled cylinder on the left, but the electronics is making sure that this proportional valve is maintaining uh, the same position on both cylinders. And something to be aware of whenever you're doing proportional valves, when you're specking a system, proportional valves can often be uh, specced out with a two to one ratio spool. And so where that helps you out is that, that if that's the case, and you can see that the, uh, the blind end of a cylinder has much larger surface area, much more volume in the blind end volume of fluid. In the annular area up here on the rod end, you, if it's a two to one ratio cylinder, you're gonna have half as much volume on the rod end. So if you had the same size uh, spool openings uh, for both sides of the cylinder, you don't get good resolution on the control uh, to and from the rod end side. So you would wanna try and buy a proportional valve with a two to one ratio and make sure that you've got it plumbed properly so that the uh, smaller volume is going to the rod side. And that really helps with the resolution and uh, uh, your, your programming people will be much happier with you for doing so. Okay, so here's the other uh, way of using a proportional valve. Uh, you can, Put a proportional valve, and I've just drawn it kind of very crudely in the middle, uh, inside of a system that's using a flow divider. So what we could be doing here is putting uh, five gallon a minute into both cylinders, but we know that there's some uh, margin of error here. And if that margin error, and 10% is high, but just for math, let's say that it's a 10% margin of error, uh, normally they're down, you know, closer to uh, three, five percent, something like that. But if you've got 10 GPM and a 10% margin of error, that means that that one of these cylinders could be leading by one gallon a minute. So you would want to get then a proportional valve, and you only need one for this type of application. But our proportional valve would need to be able to make make up for that margin of error, that one gallon per minute. So while you're sizing it out. Uh, you know, you might as well go for two gallon a minute so that you're going to be able to always accommodate for uh, any inaccuracies in those uh, flow dividers. Whether it's spool type, rotary type, uh, you know, if it's, you just got to watch that it's bi-directional if it's in this type of application. And I'm not giving you schematics to build systems by, I'm just giving you some concepts on uh, different techniques for synchronizing cylinders. So uh, we're not getting into a lot of the details. I'm just trying to provide some uh, mind opening uh, concepts. And then the last way of uh, synchronizing uh, with electronics is very simple that you would use, you know, and, and I would say, you know, same displacement pumps, but you know what, if you've got VFDs, does it really matter that the pumps, you know, are identical? I mean, so within a certain range of each other uh, is where you should go. So you should, you you can control two cylinders with two separate pumps and motor groups uh, that are controlled with VFDs. And then you've got, again, you have to have your uh, position sensing device, whatever that might be. Uh, but if you can do it like this, uh, it's highly energy efficient. So, you know, if you're if you're striving to be as uh, uh, green as possible, uh, you know, that's 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 where you might want to go. And the other part about this, electrical engineers not only like this, they love this. Uh, there's there's hardly any hydraulic voodoo in this type of a setup. And uh, in my world, there's you know easily you know 20, 50 times more electrical engineers than there are hydraulic uh, friendly engineers. So, you know, they, they love this kind of stuff. They can control it, they can tweak it. As long as you give them the right components, 
uh, you know, this is this is right down their alley, and it's easy for them to uh, maintain and troubleshoot as well. So that's a uh, uh, one of the newer concepts, and, and VFD is the same thing as uh, uh, VSD, uh, variable frequency drives used to be the term, and now they're variable speed drives. It helps people to understand them, I guess, a little bit better. Uh, while we're talking about feedback, uh, if it's a absolutely must-have, can't-fail situation, uh, I've run into places that use multiple uh, pos position sensing devices, uh, and, and not one or two, but they use three, and and then they use a voting technique so that if if any one of those fails, uh, that's okay because two will still agree, and so you know, and and it's unlikely two will fail the same. So uh, you could put on uh, multiple sensing uh, so that you know you're never uh, going to go out of uh, out of whack, uh, and as soon as one fails out of a group of three. You know, you replace it. So that's just, uh, you know, that's a high-end system. So some unexpected outcomes from using flow dividers. Uh, first topic is that if you use more than one method of synchronization, uh, it can get ugly fast. Uh, now you can use complementary methods, as we showed. You can use dosing cylinders with uh, uh, in the middle uh, with proportional control going to the dosing cylinders. You just can't have two constraining methods. So I wouldn't want to put a uh, a flow divider on my tractor front end loader uh, because it could, with its inaccuracy, drive that loader sideways and actually compromise uh, the integrity of the loader. So just be very cautious. You know, it, it's not a belt and suspenders technique that you want to do uh, with a structure uh, that is designed to keep itself uh, level. You want to, if its structure is designed as such, let it do its job. You just want to put the cylinders on uh, and make sure it maintains its levelness. If you have to, uh, put some feedback onto it so that you are able to monitor that. But realistically, uh, don't put a uh, a flow divider on it. Uh, be aware that te pressure intensification uh, can occur of cylinders, so you've got to build that into the system. Uh, you've got to think about what if this tops out? What if there's no load on this cylinder, uh, but the other one's topped out? Now that flow divider has full force to be able to intensify the pressure uh, double what, what it normally would, uh, and as, as well as the rephasing cylinders. Those can actually get intensified as well. So just be aware you've got to, you know, make uh, provisions for being able to bleed off any excess pressure, as well as being able to get them back into uh, uh, synchronization. Uh, motion sync uh, with position error. So whenever you're working with electronics, there is some error generally allowed. So you're going to want to, uh, you know, play with that. And every application may have different tolerances, and you've got to be very aware what's that controller going to do uh, whenever I'm out of position. Uh, make sure you've got the proper uh, connections available, and if it's a portable device, make sure your connections are always properly installed. We've seen people hook up uh, controls backwards. The hydraulics is hooked up correctly, and then the electronics is monitoring uh, the wrong cylinders, and that will uh, drive a cylinder or a system to failure pretty quick if you uh, uh, don't have the right position error, you know, all stop built into it. So uh, the the electronic side of it uh, can make a good system bad. Uh, it can't necessarily make a bad system good, but it can at least keep a bad system from creating a catastrophic failure. So that's my spiel for today on how to synchronize cylinders. I don't know if we've had any questions along the way, but uh, appreciate uh, everybody's participation. Uh, if you do have any questions, I guess this would be a time to either get them to Adele and, and we can uh, get into seeing if we can help you out. Uh, yes, Dan, we do have a question from Eugene Perry. Uh, does using multiple cylinders that require synchronization require more maintenance as opposed to a single cylinder? 
uh, well, I, I would say just in the in the question. So if I can use a single cylinder, I always will. So if I can build the structure so that it's going to stay level with just one cylinder, tremendous. Basically, I'm done, uh, and and that system goes forever. The uh, uh, but if I'm building a, a large structure and I have to have three or four lifting points, then I'm going to use those multiple cylinders of some configuration from dosing cylinders, and then I've got valves in the middle, uh, and I have more uh, sealing surfaces to worry about. So yes, they definitely require uh, more service, more maintenance, uh, more attention, and and you have more instruction uh, for operating the system. Like like if I only have a single cylinder, I can write you a one paragraph uh, operation manual. If I've got a dosing cylinder system, I'm probably gonna give you a two page manual uh, exactly how to get everything in phase uh, and when you know that something is uh, needing repair. So it's definitely more complicated. Uh, we have a, a very nice comment. Great presentation, Dan. Been in the industry for over 20 years and learned some great new things today. Hey. Especially like think, <laughs> thinking of VFD as varial speed device. This makes much more sense. Thank you. And, and, and honestly, that's, I think in my opening remarks, I might have said that, you know, uh, just uh, hopefully everybody learned something because uh, some of these things are kind of out of the box or combinations of them are out of the box thinking. Uh, and uh, and so hopefully, uh, you know, I really appreciate that comment and appreciate you hanging in there through my presentation. Uh, there's another question from Michael. Uh, what method would you suggest to synchronize? I'm going to read this probably wrong. 50 X cylinders at Oh, geez, plus forward slash, I, I, I'm sorry, Michael. Maybe you could uh, email that question uh, to Dan. It, the, the question is getting cut off on my end. <clears throat> Do you have another Any question? Other? And and so I, do, I would love to answer that one. Uh, I think I probably can. But if you have another one, we'll jump to that. And if not, I, I can talk for a while. <clears throat> so, I, so I'd like uh, to... No. Okay. So I, I'd make a comment, by the way. I, so I'm just going to take a guess that, hey, we got 50 cylinders that we need to synchronize. How would you recommend doing that? Well, it all depends. Who's your customer? If it's Elon Musk, I'd say with the most expensive electronics you can find. Uh, if it's the uh, house building guy or house moving guy, then you're going to come up with some way of getting 50 circuits that are going to stay synchronized. We just had a very high end client that uh, had 12 axes, 12 cylinders that they wanted to synchronize. And so I said, well, that's easy. You know, 12 proportional valves and we're done. He said, that's the problem. We don't have 12 axes of control. We have six axes of control. So that meant that I had to what the end result was, we came up with six dosing cylinders. We put the proportional control on each dosing cylinder. We put LVDTs on each of the 12 cylinders so that we knew how we were doing. Uh, and we used that combination of getting the dosing cylinders set just right. And uh, then once every once we tighten the chain on, on all the cylinders, everybody's sitting at the right level at that point we start driving the dosing cylinders and all 12 axes maintained you know plus or minus half a percent uh and so if i were doing 50 cylinders i would be looking at some combination of uh you know am i using two different uh techniques here we have another one where we're doing 10 cylinders and <laughs> i haven't done this yet so it's but but we're going to do 10 cylinders on a budget and i'm i'm really the, the system's going to be controlling 
a flow divider that is only controlling four of those 10 cylinders. And I'm gonna make everybody else play along together. And it's a fairly large uh, platform that's gonna be tilted. And if we just teed all the cylinders together, even though they might be lifting you know, the same load somewhat, one side could go up higher than the others and just kind of run out of control. So we need to make sure really end to end are kept together and then we're going to tie into middle cylinders and then we're gonna make the other ones uh, play by the control or the uh, flow dividers of the four. So then we'll have six basically uh, you know, freestyle cylinders, but we're gonna make sure that they play together. And we could do that by pressure reducing uh, to just make them never be able to be at the exact same pressure. So they can never overrun the four that have flow dividers on them. Anything else? Okay, we have a few more questions that popped in. Uh, Jan, yes, this seminar uh, will be available on the, in the members only section of the IFPS website probably tomorrow morning. Um, what are the recommended rephasing valve type options among direct acting re relief style, et cetera? Any thoughts and insights on selection of these and pros and cons to consider? Okay, what was the first part of that question? What are your recommended rephasing valve type options among direct acting relief style, et cetera? Well, one thing is, you know, we like direct acting reliefs uh, where they need to uh, work fast and uh, and they generally have uh, better leakage, uh, less leakage across them. So, uh, you know, that's that's where we go to is direct acting. Now, as far as styles of direct acting, uh, I mean, we we generally use pop it type so i'm not really sure uh where we're headed you know what else they're looking for on that uh yeah it, then there's a, a second part that says this is in regard to internal volume bypass at cylinder position when using different areas so if if i were doing a i i i would not sure if, if I'm confused. If I were doing rephasing cylinders, uh, I'm not putting a relief in the piston uh, as much as I am putting a poppet in a in actual like a, a PO check, but but the 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 check is being physically uh, pushed off of the seat by a stem that goes to the top of the piston. So I'm not saying to put a relief in there. Maybe I should have been clear on that. Uh, if I were doing an external uh, relief, then I'm okay with, you know, if an ex external uh, prevention of pressure intensification, then I would use a relief uh, in that circuit. And, uh, and again, I would use a very low leakage relief and, and look at them all. You know, many of them say, you know, four drops per minute uh, at full pressure, uh, you know, that's plenty adequate uh, because, you know, you're, you're getting four drops a minute probably across the cylinder seals. Uh, so, so I would use a, if I was doing it internally, it would just be a poppet that allows oil to bleed from the rod end to the blind end of the, of the piston. If I'm doing it external, then I would use a direct acting relief. Okay, and I think we have a, a number of thanks. Have a good day. Um, I don't see any other technical questions. Anyone want to know where I get my hair cut at or anything? No, just <laughs> uh, no technical questions. One guy just wants to know. No, but I do need to ask, behind you on your shelf, your left shoulder, is that a fluid power reference handbook peeking out? Uh, it's red. No. It's red. No. Okay. Just curious. That would that would be that would be like this. <laughs> well, the the new one. Oh. 
the no, new Blue Tower reference handbook. Yeah, okay. This, this one's, you know, well used, but but it doesn't. It actually never makes it to the shelf. Generally speaking, it's always where I can just grab it. Uh, lightning reference um, book. Okay. No, so I so I need to get that that it sounds like though. So yeah. Anything okay. else? Okay. Sounds great. If anything anybody else? needs anything, there's my email. And uh, send me something with Thanks a very everyone. short subject line. I don't read long subject lines, so it has to be a short subject line. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for attending, Dan. It was a wonderful presentation, and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thanks everyone. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, make better hydraulics. See y'all. <laughs>